Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is David Zyla. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American public in the fine arts. Uh, every year, uh, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. You can visit the National Arts Club at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Following this conversation will be a brief Q&A. Uh, feel free to put all questions into the chat. So today, um, we're really excited to take a peek into the Illinois State Museum's closet. Um, we're going to be going through the closet with curator Erica Holst and historical textiles consultant, Christine Masrum. This is gonna be a behind the scenes tour of the museum's textile storage area to get a sense of the true scope of the museum's collections. Let me tell you a little bit about our guests. Uh, Erica Holst is the curator of history at the Illinois State Museum and has worked in the public hi history field for more than 15 years, during which time she has curated more than a dozen exhibitions. Her 2013 exhibition, Hidden in Plain Sight, The Material World of Early Springfield, won the Illinois State Historical Society's Award for Superior Achievement. Before joining the Illinois State Museum, Erica served as curator of collections at the historic Ed Ed Edwards Place in Springfield, Illinois. Her publications include Wicked Springfield, Crime, Corruption, and Scandal During the Lincoln Era, Edwards Place, A Springfield Treasure, and Historic Houses of Lincoln's Illinois, as well as several scholarly and popular articles. She hosts a master's, she holds a master's degree from the Winter Program in Early American Culture. Christine Masrum has been involved in living history programs and historical clothing research for nearly 20 years. She worked as an interpreter in the living history program at Lincoln's New Salem State Historic Site and as a historical archaeology laboratory assistant for the Illinois State Archaeology archaeological survey. Her it, research interests include fashions of the empire, early romantic and Belle Epoque to World War II eras. She currently works as an environmental chemist in Illinois. Welcome Erica and Christine. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. We are in the textiles lab of the Illinois State Museum. So this is truly a behind the scenes tour. Um, and I'm here with Christine and um, we have Sarah behind the camera. And I was wondering, Sarah, if you could just do a little bit of a 360 spin to give our viewers a sense of um, where we are. We, the Illinois State Museum has a fairly significant collection of historical textiles and we're particularly particularly strong in quilts and in women's clothing. And so today, um, as David said, we are literally going to be going into the museum's um, closet. Christine and I have selected several boxes that we're going to just open up for you and go through and kind of talk through what we see. So um, for clothing nerds like myself and Christine, this is a little bit like Christmas morning. Um, you often don't know what you're going to find. I certainly haven't been through every single box in our collections, so it's always fun to see what comes to light here. So uh, the first garment we've selected for you here um, is on view and um, Sarah, let's see if you can, Sarah's gonna man the like wide angle and I'm going to man the, um, the close angle here, if I can. Um, so this garment here dates to probably around 1810, is that what you'd say? Yeah, teens or 20s. It's, um, it's pretty classic of like the teens or 20s uh, era. It's just this really fine, uh, I'm not sure if it's linen or, or cotton, it's probably cotton muslin um, with white work embroidery. And um, this is, it's the oldest thing that that you guys have in the collection, isn't it? Erica? It is the oldest garment, yes. Um, we're, we start to become stronger around the turn of, or the mid 19th century. 
Um, so this is your classic. Um, so if anyone's just watched Bridgerton, this is the OG. <laughs> yeah. Bridgerton took a little bit of creative license with their costuming. Um, this is, you know, the type of garment that actually would have been worn during the time. And it's characterized by that um, empire style, like, um, you know, high waisted and this um, wonderful muslin fabric. And if you felt it, it's, or linen actually, it is it? Okay. I think it's linen. It might be linen. It's linen or cotton. I can't really tell. It's so fine. I wish you guys could feel some of these fabrics that, that we touched today because some of them are going to be just amazing. And just a quick note, um, if you're wondering why we're, you know, putting our paws all over the historic clothing, um, often we get asked, why aren't you wearing gloves? And actually the, the best practices for textile handling is to have clean, dry hands. Um, if we were to wear gloves and put our hands on things and try to examine some of the fine details, we would lose some of that dexterity that you need. Um, so we're keeping our fine motor skills intact and just putting our, our clean hands judiciously on these garments. But what's wonderful about older garments like this, um, so the way that it's fastened in the back, um, they're tied with um, ties rather than buttons or hooks and eyes. And Christine, haven't you found archaeological evidence of pins used to fasten the bags yes. too? Yes, so buttons prior to like uh, maybe 1845 weren't really used to, as a fastener on women's clothing. They were used plenty as decorative items. But um, yeah, you find lots of straight pins, especially in ash deposits in archaeological sites because they're, they're sweeping the ash and they pick up the pins along the way. But um, so some, a garment like this would have been tied at the neck and then at the waist and then just a couple of straight pins put in in between and maybe one down here if you were very modest. Um, this one is also interesting. We were looking at the inner construction of it and it's got, so linings were very common in this period. Um, they're usually all the way across. I haven't really seen one like this where it's just on the back. So this is the side seam here, and this is the back center. Um, so that was kind of a, hmm, I wonder, wonder why that is, um, which is one of the wonderful things about going through the collections here. We always find things that we're like, huh, what's that for? Um, isn't there a nice repair on this one too? I, can't it is. I think it's on the front. Oh, if you so. want to Oh, right. Oh, yes. There's a nice mend right there in the center. And um, we love to see this. We live in such an era of fast fashion that um, we've almost come to treat our clothing as disposable. And it's just wonderful to see in the 19th century how much care people put into garments, where mending garments was part of a women's daily routine and really a fact of life that she would do um, from the time she was old enough to hold and master a needle until the very end of her life. So um, it really speaks to the way these garments were just used and lived in. And then I'll show you just a few more details of this wonderful um, detail embroidery on the bottom. Oh, this is so classic. If you if you look at old like Goni's magazines in the 19th century, they have little diagrams of embroidery patterns that you can do on your hem. And this just looks like it's straight out of Goni's. It's just absolutely classic. There's all these little French knots, these beautiful satin stitch feathers. And I just saw a comment, if you're able to see the details, um, are, are you at home able to see me holding up my camera here? If they go to the full screen view of all four participants. Okay, if you go to the full screen view of all four participants, um, you'll see both the wide shot and the close-up details. The details are great. Yeah, and then the... Uh, we can find some of the stitching. I mean, you know, this hand stitching that's like practically um, invisible. Pretty much, there's such tiny stitches with such fine thread. It's just beautiful, beautiful work. And so now we'll move on to, um, we're gonna go to the other end of the 19th century here. I'm gonna set my camera down for just a second. And now we are looking at um, 
a late 19th century dress. Yeah, I was trying to remember what the date. Did we find a date on this one? Or... We didn't, but I'm going to go ahead and say um, 1890s. Um, these little like puffed sleeves and oh, this high yeah. collar right here and the um, construction. And what's wonderful is the 1890s is kind of one of the last gasps of um, complicated, um, complicated clothing construction. There's a real move towards um, more wearable dress in the 19th century for women that includes um, separates, the use of a shirt waist and skirt, but they're sort of from the 1890s um, into the 1900s, clothing gets like really, really complicated. You start to see things like um, the boning built in, you see a lot of hooks and eyes. Oftentimes in 1890s or 1900s bodice, it's fastened like three ways, three sets of hooks and eyes. This one's great because it's got the uh, waist tape from the maker, which is Grand Magazine du Louvre. So um, I'm assuming this is a Paris made creation, which you do find showing up on some of the well dressed women of Illinois in the 19th century. And uh, this waist tape here is meant to kind of take the tension off the hooks and eyes. If anyone has ever tried to button or zip themselves into a garment that's just slightly tight, you know, there's a lot of like tension in your waist area. This is meant to contain that all on the inside so your hooks and eyes aren't like gapping on the outside. And it just kind of holds the garment together. And I, I want to point out too, like Erica was saying uh, with the construction, um, there's all this adding stitching on this, which you don't really see much anymore outside of like couture or, you know, bespoke tailoring. Um, but this was, this was just, uh, you know, somebody's, what would you say, like walking dress, afternoon dress? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. The construction is just so impressive on some of these, everything's so nicely lined and interlined. And, um, you know, of course, in contrast with what we were just looking at, there's all this decorative detail, too. We've got all these tucks, there's different fabrics, um, everything, you know, in the sewing machine era. Oh, yeah, I get this big button oh, yeah. and then the lace on the cuff. Um, yeah, everything just got really complicated in the late 19th century. It did, yes. The sewing machine was supposed to be a time saver, and in some cases, it was. Um, But it also just made ladies say, oh, well, I can add another ruffle here and I can add another bow here and I can, you know, use two fabrics and stitch them up the side. And There's a question on the embroidery on the first one. Was it done with silk thread? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Let's see. Mm, it feels like cotton to me. It's possible that it's kind of maybe a rougher silk. I'd hate to commit myself without my microscope. It's quite thick thread, actually. It's not. It's not super fine on the embroidery. The the super fine thread is on the which probably you can't even see on camera. <laughs> Good question. Okay, uh, we will go to. Um, Another box. Right. I love this one. <laughs> So tell us about this color, Erica. Isn't this wonderful? This is this um, really wonderful acid green that became popular in the mid 19th century. And um, this, uh, you're probably aware, um, is often the result of using arsenic in garments. Um, the later part of the 19th century saw real innovations in synthetic textile dyes, which led to these beautiful colors that people love to have. But you know the 
the kinks weren't necessarily worked out in um, achieving these safely. And what, what year is this about? Is this, this one, I would say, is back half of the 1860s okay. um, because it's got this little train going on uh, here. Okay. And so a lot of our, um, our costumes um, were transferred to us by both the University of Illinois and the Illinois State University. And so a lot of times um, these garments were used in those settings in their textile and home economics departments. And they came to us without provenance, sadly. So we often don't know who wore them. Um, they were collected mainly for aesthetic purposes. But this one's wonderful because it still has its collar attached. Um, That's beautiful. I love this, the fringe detailing too, how it just kind of swoops over you know, what's supposed to be the full part of the bust in that era. So if you want to um, see the details, um, if you have your view where you're looking at the view of all the presenters, um, you'll be able to see the widescreen in one um, version and my handheld phone, which will show the details in another version. Is the green dye still poisonous? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, heavy metals tend to be forever. I'm an environmental chemist. Arsenic is, is not fun. Um, so there probably is still some arsenic in it. You really, in order to absorb it into your skin, you really have to be wearing it next to your skin and like sweating profusely with like open pores. So I would say, you know, just us touching it, we're fine. It's okay. <laughs> We're not going to try it on. <laughs> We're not going to try it on. But. <laughs> and so um, this dress was previously exhibited. So we've got some modern tape here that was added to stabilize it for exhibition. Yeah, there's a nice lining in here, but it is shattering, as you can see, quite a bit. The bodice lining is great, though. Look at these nice curved seams on the back. That's gorgeous lovely details. I just love all the little details like that in, in clothing of this era. Just how everything's attached, like the selvage edge of the fabric there. Waist knot. And then at the bottom, there's, um, there's kind of a, a stiffener and a liner on the train um, that's made out of crinoline fabric, which literally is woven from horse hair. Yeah, so you can see the horse hair sticking out. It's really stiff. So is that, is it a stiffener or is it just because you're dragging this part and so this is stronger? Maybe it won't wear out? So um, yeah, you know, you know what, I think okay. that's, that's probably more accurate since it is dragging on the ground. Yeah. Um, a dress Erica? Like this, Erica? Yes. And Christine, um, we have a question um, from Paula on what your guess is on the weight of this dress. So the weight of the garment itself, um, maybe a couple pounds. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this completed ensemble is just the very top layer that starts with, um, there could be up to a dozen layers. It starts with a chemise, a corset cover, um, panelettes, under petticoat, over petticoat, potentially corset cover. So if you know a dress like this was made of like a heavier winter weight wool, and you've got all the layers on, you could be looking at like 10 to 15 pounds of, of clothing that women were wearing. And that's part of the reason why corsets were so important um, is because it helps to distribute the weight of all that garment. So it's not all like dragging around your waist. Very good question. Yeah, sometimes it's, it is difficult to, to judge the weight of these things because they're delicate. You can't just pick the whole thing up without it being in a box. So yeah, that's, that's very good. We'll keep going. All right. I'm gonna put the camera down again for just a second. Let's see. 
So questions come in. How often do you think people wash their everyday clothing? That is a great question. And that makes me actually want to skip ahead to our underpinnings box and talk about under, underpinnings. I think it was something. Yeah. Okay, fantastic question. And that is why we would love to introduce you to underpinnings. And let's actually move this one aside and start with a chemise. Oh, so that's okay. our Good foundational layer. We'll come back to these. Okay, please meet the chemise. And this is a woman's basic foundational garment of the 19th century. Um, this is what a lady would wear closest to her skin. And this is the thing that's going to absorb all the sweat and oils from your body. Um, and it's your foundational layer. So this is what you wash. The, like the acid green silk dress that you washed is not going to, it's, it might get spot cleaned if you spill something on it or get a grease stain or whatever, but um, it's, it's not something that can be washed. So everything that can be soiled is going to be of a washable fabric next to your skin. And these chemises were often made from either linen or cotton. And linen is just such a beautiful fabric for that type of thing um, because a really fine linen, the more you wash it, the softer it will get. Mm -hmm. And this one, again, it's beautiful. It's soft. It's silky. Um, this one has a laundry mark, which oh, is wonderful. Yes. And it looks like her name is Laura P. Baldwin. Oh, wow. And a laundry mark is the literal equivalent of writing your child's name in their underpants with a Sharpie before you send them to summer camp. The point is when your garments are getting washed, you want to make sure that the right garment goes back to the right owner after the wash cycle. Um, so if you ever happen to see a, you know, historical reenactor or a costume drama where someone is just wearing the corset on their bare skin, it's not accurate. Uh, people <laughs> would have worn a corset over a chemise. Your corset is kind of a more heavy duty. It's more of an investment. Um, it's something that you don't want getting like soiled. You don't want it rubbing and chafing up against your skin. And women would have multiple chemises. It's, oh, wow. um, oh, yeah. it's like underwear today, you know, pretty much. Right? And I mean, you can see how simple this garment is too. It's basically just two lengths of fabric that have been sewn together, gathered at the top, and then there's a couple little um, kind of rhombus shaped pieces for the sort of sleeves. I've even seen them where it's just kind of a rectangle with a diamond shaped gusset maybe on the underarm. Um, so they're not, you know, it's not something that's super intensive to make. You're just gonna kind of throw one together in a weekend if you really need to. Obviously the lace work is what took the longest on this one. And it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's beautiful. And we have another question from Ruth um, yes. who's asking, uh, were underpants worn under this? Ooh, that's a very good question. That is a very good question. So um, the 19th century equivalent are drawers. Um, because you draw them up. And these became fashionable in urban areas around about the 1830s and 40s. And by the mid 19th century, they had spread in popularity to where like most everyone wore drawers. And in the beginning, um, they actually had a split seam um, for ease of using the restroom. As the century progresses, you start to see more like closed seamed drawers and um and then you even see like combinations where your chemise might have little like you know knickers on the bottom and it's kind of a one-piece thing i always wonder how they they did use the bathroom in those because i when i worked at new salem we had to dress head to toe in 1830s and i always had the the split drawers because you have to use the necessary and i i don't know how it could have been done without the added when you've got five petticoats on especially if you get a crinoline I've always been curious about that. Good question. And then with men, um, men's drawers were kind of 
maybe, maybe it's sort of optional, you know, and probably more likely to be worn during the winter. Yeah. Um, um, but talk about their shirts. Yeah, the, the, that was the thing in the 19th century with men's shirts. Um, they're not like they are now where you just kind of like tuck it in. A lot of them were knee length or lower. Um, so what you would do, it's a big wide thing. Um, so you would actually like reach through your legs and pull them back up and kind of create a set of drawers out of your shirt and then pull your pants on. So it wasn't really super necessary. Um, like you said, maybe in the winter, if you just want an extra layer, but yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the shirts were, were meant to be worn. Christine and Erica, uh, we have another question from Mara and uh, Mara wants to know, is it true? True that the rich women wore their dresses no more than once or twice and then gave them away. I I can't say one way or the other. I haven't seen solid historical evidence that um, suggests that. Um, I have seen quotes that like all but the very wealthiest women will make over their dresses and. This is, this is not like a historical source, but if anyone's read or seen Age of Innocence, um, there's a line in there where May talks about she wishes she could wear her wedding dress to a social event, but she can't because it's at works being made over. So even, you know, May, who's in the 400 of New York, is making over her wedding dress so she can continue to wear it. So um, pro probably, I mean, like never say never, you know? Yeah, there's I mean, there's always been extreme fashion as long as there's been fashion. <laughs> so I would not put it past somebody. Um, but yeah, like you said, I mean, there's, uh, I heard a story recently about a dress that was like a, a robe a la Francaise, um, big, wide 18th century skirt down in Cahokia, Illinois, that um, somebody made into two dresses for their daughters in the early 19th century. And that survives with the family. Oh, that's so, amazing. Yeah, <laughs> um, there was certainly a lot of that. I, I think... If you wore it once and gave it away, you were at like the very, very tippy top of the, you know, social and financial pyramid. I think yeah. pretty much everyone else would have um, tried to be a little bit more conservative with their clothes. Yeah, maybe I like Ava Vanderbilt or somebody yeah. had to do that, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then um, moving on to more undergarments, we have a few versions of corsets here. This is a corset which very helpfully tells us that it's patented in 1892. Um, and this one's great because it has, one of its garters still survives. Oh, and so it's on great. This. It's so wide, so much wider than you typically see. And it's got these great ruffles on the side. And this is actually rubber in the middle there. It still feels a little bit sticky. It's not really that stretchy anymore. But. And here's a, you know, the, the, the construction of corsets from about the 1820s on is when the split busk was invented. So this is the busk here in the front. Um, this means that you can put it on yourself. It's helpful if you have an extra pair of hands, um, but it's not necessary because you can kind of loosen this up, get your laces aligned, then you put it on, hook it around your waist, hook it up, and then you will reach behind and kind of tighten your laces. Um, so it's not the case that, you know, only women with servants could wear corsets. They were really like a standard um, foundational garment up and down the, the social scale. And then this one here is called a corset cover. And this is again, more of an optional garment. This would be worn on top of the corset and it's meant um, to prevent the corset, this hardware from rubbing up against the inside of your garment and um, provide an extra layer of warmth and modesty. If it's summer and you're wearing a very sheer dress, of course, a cover would kind of keep, keep all this hidden. Yeah, just another, another layer to make sure everything is where it should be, which I, I feel like we're not really concerned with anymore. People don't really wear foundation garments every day. So there's, you know, the silhouette doesn't require it, but throughout the 19th century and even into the early 20th, you had to wear a foundation garment in order to look right. You absolutely did. Um, and you had mentioned how the, the clothing was bespoke and really it was until the end of the 19th century, garments were custom made for an individual. And so your bodice, which tended to fit fairly tightly, was made to your measurements and made to your measurements in a corset, you know? So you put on the corset, you lace it to whatever, you know, 
circumference is comfortable for you. And if you don't have that corset on, your garment just isn't going to fit right. Yeah, which you can see in some of um, you know the, the TV historical dramas. I know I've been watching some where you catch a glimpse of an extra that like, oh, they're not wearing a corset that it really shows. <laughs> but... <laughs> And then um, if we go back in time a little bit. We've got an earlier version back here. Oh, I love this one. Oh my gosh. So th this is my era. <laughs> this is like 1820s, 30s. So the, the biggest difference that you'll notice in this corset versus the late 19th century is that there's no boning. Um, this has really like thick whale bones in it. Um, this one does not, it just has cording in it, uh, which is super common in the early 19th century. A lot of the, um, the corsets, quote unquote corsets, um, that you'll see in this time period, they're really stays. This is what we would call stays because um, there's not really boning. There would have been a wooden busk down the front here to just kind of like lift and separate, give you a little little bit of support in the belly area. And um, these, you know, they weren't meant to be tight like a corset. The, the silhouette uh, was high-waisted. It wasn't really meant to be like itty-bitty waist, flared hip. Um, it was more just to support you and keep you comfortable throughout the day. So um, yeah, I just love this piece. It's absolutely wonderful. The construction is great. It's got a laundry mark. This one uh, was embroidery and this was um, common, more common in the 18th and early 19th century to um, do a hand embroidered little initial. Oh my God, I can't look at the size of that next to my thumb. It is, those are the tiniest stitches ever. <laughs> That's crazy. I just love this. And yeah, the back is, is very much the same. It's got these hand, hand done eyelets. Um, feels like there might be something in the center of the eyelet there, uh, like a little metal ring to kind of give it a little more support. But yeah, it would have just been laced up. And again, you're not lacing these things tight, so it's not terribly difficult to put on yourself. They're great in the summertime. And then this is another um, corset cover that's actually just came off exhibit and we had it on exhibit um, as an example of mending. There's this wonderful patch on the back here. And this is right about where um, the woman's laces would have been. And so we're, we're speculating that the laces probably rubbed up against her corset cover and wore it out and she needed to patch just from kind of heavy use. I would say totally why that, that seems very lovely. And we'll move along. Sorry, I'm going to put my phone down again and we'll switch boxes. Do the clothing donors tell the museum the names of the designers or seamstresses? Um, it, if it's known, yes. Um, if, we, if I were to solicit a donation today, um, we send out a donor questionnaire form that says, tell me everything you know about it exactly. So if that information is known, we absolutely want to capture it. Um, a lot of times the donations we get are, you know, my grandmother died and this was in the attic. This was her dress, you know, so if we know who the wearer was and have provenance on that, we, we kind of consider ourselves lucky. Um, sometimes we'll also get lucky and there will be like a, a maker's tag, especially if it's from a well-known designer um, within the garment. But sometimes that information is just lost to history, you know, the donor doesn't know, or like these garments that were transferred for other institutions, it wasn't captured upon donation. And so it's kind of lost to history. So they want to know, if you don't know the providence of the garments, uh, how wide they end up here? 
Um, you know, that's a good question. And the answer is that um, the ones that we have here um, are a product of an earlier collecting philosophy that tended to be more encyclopedic. Um, the idea being like, we want representation of all women's clothing. And so there was this huge collection of 19th century women's clothing that's for the most part in good condition. So, you know, the museum at the time said yes. Um, museum practices change, collecting philosophies change. Our current collecting philosophy um, focuses on individual stories. We like objects um, that have personal meaning, but that also kind of can reflect a larger historical context. So I wouldn't take a garment without provenance at this point. I want to know um, who used it, who made it, if any case. And it also can't be redundant to the collection. So if we have several examples, I wouldn't take it. Um, one thing that we're really striving to do now is um, who start collecting in terms of historically marginalized voices. So um, people who have traditionally not seen their garments and their stories represented in um, collections are collecting focus now and kind of, you know, um, middle-class white people's wedding dresses. Um, we're, we're good on and probably won't be taking on too many of those. Um, is Illinois known for being a specialist in these things? She is on the East Coast. In garments? I assume so. Um, you know, locally, um, I think we kind of fly a little bit under the radar. People are familiar with kind of the more major um, costume holding institutions, but this has sort of been like a, a locally kept secret. In fact, we did a historic clothing um, exhibit that just closed earlier this year. And it was the first time that we'd ever done a garment exhibition and that they'd ever been on view. So we're sort of trying to raise the profile and make um, you know scholars and researchers aware that we do have this resource here. Oh yeah, switching so, gears. Switching gears, <laughs> we're jumping into the 20th century now. And again, um, these garments come to us. This is from a collection with no provenance. Um, so we, we know nothing about it except that it exists. Yeah. Um, and are, are kind of debating about the age. I think we landed on the 18, or sorry, 18, 1920s. Probably 20s, maybe 30s. Um, it's, it's what they, they call a Hungarian, quote unquote, style dress. I, I really don't know where that name comes from maybe somebody in the audience can enlighten us on that um it's it always has this really beautiful kind of variegated embroidery work it's usually a single color but i have seen them in multiple colors the blue on white was really popular these lovely like almost sort of looks like a faggoted scene there um, you know, it was it was kind of a summer dress and it was a little bit bohemian. It's kind of like what, you know, for lack of a better word, hippies wore in the 1920s. Um, it was just, you know, against the norm, which was very kind of straight and prim and proper. Um, and these had a little bit of shaping to them and they were just funky and cool. Also very nice fabric, really like gauzy see-through cotton. It's so, so lightweight. Obviously would have had a slip under. So in the, in the 1920s, um, was it embroidered first or hemmed and then embroidered over the hem? Oh, that's a good question. Looks like it was embroidered first and then hemmed. Looks like it was embroidered first and then hemmed. Yeah, that's a really deep hem too. So I don't know if maybe this was longer at one point and somebody took it up or if it's just always been that short. Um, I don't know. I kind of have to see that on a dummy to see how this works or it, it, would it work with more negative space underneath it too. I'm not sure. I really love this kind of smocking detail too. It's the really I'm not sure if they had a machine to do that by the 1920s or if that's all done by hand. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, here we 
file under things that should have been worn to the Met Gala last week. Yes, we were talking about this. This is a metallic silver 1920s dress. Um, and so we said, this should have been at the Met Gala. <laughs> and it's just so like classic 20s. Look at the, this hem that has these little handkerchief details every so often. And it's just, yeah, this luscious like silver gold lace. Oh, there's even more of these. I didn't notice this. That would have been really sweet. Okay. Christine, about Christine. Does the museum have any and, um, christening clothing? We oh, you saw that guy. Yes. <laughs> we have several garments. Um, in fact, one, and it's at our other storage location, um, but it was actually worn by five generations of the same family starting in the 1860s. And then the most recent one, I think, was in the 1990s. Um, oh. They all wore that. That dress. That's a wonderful story. I love the stories that go with these. Yeah, so this was another one that we didn't know much about, right? It was just like, oh, pretty. Yeah, exactly. That's and then the one underneath is pretty as well. Oh, right. Do you have any 1920 flapper dresses? I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> that first one um, qualifies, and then ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Yeah, this one, oh my gosh. Look at this color. It just, it changes with the light. It's so beautiful. It's like, what is it, silk charmeuse? Um, and then this lace is so trippy. I've never really seen lace like that before. It just looks so deco era. Is it lined underneath on that lace? Is it? Or is that, that's just a front panel, I see. It. Yeah, that's okay. So this is, yeah, this kind of open thing is kind of an apron front, and then this is actually the front of the dress. Oh yeah, back. To um, the back. It's got this oh, yes. really and then, sexy flush colored stripe all the way down the back. Yeah, Christine and I were debating about this. We can't tell if this was an alteration, did someone need this dress to be wider? But we kind of think this was just sort of like a sexy little period detail. I think it was because we were looking at the neckline up there and it looks like, so you can see the, the pink rolled silk has a seam in the middle here, but there's not really seams on either side of that that would say, oh, this neckline was, this was added um, when this was added. It, it just kind of looks like, oh, it was probably built that way, so. Two questions about this dress. One, are there any maker labels on either of these? And then how would they get the color? Um, maker labels, no, and those are kind of hit and miss, um, depending on how prominent your dressmaker or costume house was, they might sew in a custom label. Um, a lot of these are still made by home sewers. Yeah, who, or just like the lady down the street that, that's a good seamstress. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these probably weren't even made in shops. Um, if it was homemade or if it was made by a family member or a friend or just, you know, the local lady that likes to sew. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the dyes, um, this is outside my expertise, but I'm going to have to go out and limb and say that by the 20th century, we're well into the era of synthetic dyes. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, it could be, the color is so kind of rich in this one. I don't, I'm not sure if it's just a really fine fabric or it could be an acid dye too, um, which is really common on silk fabrics pre, you know, 1950. Um, but yeah, it could, it could be some new synthetic thing too and I'm not really sure. And then any headdresses that went with these? We don't have any that survived, but people had cool headdresses oh, in yeah. the 1920s. They had yeah. these little like caps that they would wear and yeah, yeah and the, the cloche hats and yeah, yeah unfortunately. Yeah. Sometimes with wedding dresses we'll get an entire ensemble, you know, because someone will have saved the dress and the shoes and the gloves and the fan. And so we'll get the whole picture. Normally though, um, we get garments that are kind of devoid of context. You know, we don't know what shoes or which stockings or which handbag someone wore with them. Well those things are probably changed a little bit too, just like we do today. You know, um, if, if, 
you, you had a sister in the family, maybe two people wore this dress. And so they wore different shoes with it and they wore different headbands. You know, you don't know. That's true. That's true. Or you restyle it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like Absolutely. this season, I'm going to wear it with a, you know, purple hat. Yeah. And, yeah. No, it's a, a great way to just like keep a garment fresh is to update the accessories. So yeah. Okay, someone had asked about flapper dresses, and this is the flapperiest flapper dress we could find. Pretty much, oh man. Yeah, it's got sequins, it's got lame, it's, it's just all sequined and beaded net. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, and it's got this great, that's really thick, isn't it? Double layer. Oh my gosh. It's, I mean, I think this is woven metal. It's like is it? Fine metal. I mean, it feels it like it. It feels cold like metal. That's great. Um, yeah, I think you might be right. Wow. And we discover as we go, go along. Yeah, so. we do. <laughs> it's got this nice kind of like crushed drape to it. It reminds me of like a Delphos gown or something. Uh, yeah, that's pretty flappery. And what's kind of been interesting to me is I, in my head, I had some stereotypes about flappers that became disabused the longer that I was in this job. Uh, you know, the, there's an idea that flappers are wearing like short dresses. And in reality, um, the 1920s skirt hemlines came up, but they were never above the knee, mm -hmm. you know, so there's no mini dresses. Um, and there's no stiletto heels. You often, if you're going to a costume <laughs> party now, people often like pair these with spike heels and like heels in the 1920s were frumpy. They were low and they were clunky, you know, so there's not really like... <laughs> So, okay, I see the issue of gloves is um, coming up. Um, I prefer not to wear gloves. I operate with clean hands because I've lost, when you wear gloves, um, you lose the dexterity and the tactileness of being able to kind of handle fine details. And yes, I know they're nitrile gloves. They still don't do it for me. I still feel like I'm losing the sensation of my fingertips and I really need that like fine motor control so I don't, you know, grab a sequin and rip it off um, kind of ham handedly. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a chemist and I've worn nitrile gloves and they are, they have some stickiness to them. They're not perfect. So hands are better. It's all that they're clean. What Christine kind of undergarment would you put oh, under that? Okay. Oh man, um, I mean, in the 20s, they had like a foundation garment that was meant to just kind of like make you kind of cylinder mm -hmm. shaped. So in contrast to the, the corsets of the, the early 20th century, like in the teens, uh, where you had little bitty waists. Um, this was more about like flatten the chest, make the, the waist and hips kind of the same. Boxy, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, some kind of slip underneath it, probably pretty plain, I would mm -hmm. think. You know? patterned or uh, just kind of let the sequins do their job yeah and the slips i've seen are the same they're basically like rectangles with straps yeah, pretty you know? much it's just like it might be a couple of tucks at top but yeah that's yeah pretty simple so and that one's actually got a little bit of a scoop neckline so um you could play with that where you have like the, the neckline of your slip peeking out just a little bit at the top yeah it's like what kind of stitchy paper is used in the boxes? Acid free. <laughs> yeah. 
And so this is a dress. This is a another gold lame dress. And did we land on an era? Um, I think I'm not sure. I think we saw it oh 20s, 30s. Um, I don't know, it looks full 20s to me, even 30s, really. I think it, I think we went back and forth between the 20s and like 60s. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you're right. This would be just as at home in the 60s, I think. Um, I think I just, I'm not sure we looked in this last time, though. So I think I just found our answer. <laughs> it's actually got a slip um, intact under here. And that looks very 20s it to me. It does look very 20s. But this is a, like, modern, cutting-edge 20s dress. Yeah, this is super fashionable. It's got, it's just... I mean, this thing would move with you so much. It's just got drapey things everywhere. And of course the gold is gonna catch the light. Um, I mean, I'd love to see somebody make a copy of this and put it on and dance the Charleston because it's just gonna move. Yeah, that's the so thing nice. when you're looking at it in a box and um, when we did the fashion exhibit, um, seeing it on a 3D form, it's just a completely different, you know, you really, see and understand the garment better than so oh, yeah. kind of laid out 2D. This one had the cape, I think. Let's find the cape. Oh, did it have the cape? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Gorgeous matching evening cape with these big long ties to make kind of like a placebo. Which is why I think we went back to like the 60s, early 70s. Yeah, with the but... colors. I mean, look at this like celadon green and that sort of like, what would you call that color? It's a magenta, but um, oh, yeah, it's pink a, or yeah. raspberry pink. Raspberry, that's probably a good. And then it's got this amazing oh, faded detail. I love that. This is uh, unbelievable. Wow. Uh, yes, Mara, Mara is asking, what is the oldest dress that you own and the newest one? So the oldest dress is probably the 1810 dress that we started off with at the beginning of the program. I'm sorry um, if you missed that one. And the newest dress, um, we just acquired this fantastic tangerine colored dress that was worn by a local drag performer named Mahogany Knight when she was crowned Miss Gay of the USA in 2007. So um, spanning about near two centuries. And of course, in, in Illinois, we uh, history starts in, you know, 1818, as far as past museum collecting practices have gone. So um, we don't, we don't reach back quite as far, um, which is the fun of being on the East Coast is you have these collections that like really reach back into history. Yeah, this was a great discovery when we got together to pull some of these boxes. It was just like, oh my gosh, we got this dress. There's this nice... What is that? Is that a shoulder? You know what? I wonder if that's a shoulder oh, thing. Be. I was, when it was crumpled up, I thought, oh, it must be a waist tie, but I think you might be right. Or, I don't know. There's so much going on because we've already yeah. got a bow around the neck. We've already got some, a cape on the shoulders. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm not sure how you would. Maybe that's for the hair. Maybe it's like Maybe it's a tie. Yeah. I don't know. Or down. You we welcome it. any suggestions <laughs> if anyone has any thoughts to offer. That's the great thing about some of these that we don't know much about. We can just speculate so much about what these things are. And I just glanced at the time and saw that we are five minutes out from we're the end of the we're hour. Great. I'm um, sorry. We just no, wrapped up we're this. having such a good time. Um, Mike, I have a question and that, it, well, first of all, I have a comment. Earlier, you said that going through the collection is kind of like Christmas morning. And I have to say, this is my favorite Christmas of all time. Um, and I think for our audience, I, we're hearing comments like more, more, more um, in the comment section. Um, Mike, I have a few questions. And if, if um, others have questions, please type them into the chat. Um, my first question is, what is something that you would love to have in the collection that you currently don't? Oh, um, oh my gosh. Um, any um, garments from um, African-American individuals from the 19th century, I would love. And those just 
are rare to begin with. Um, and we don't have any, sadly. So, so that would be huge. Um, we are not strong. Anything 18th century, we're not strong on. I would love to, you know, go earlier than that 1810s dress. Um, any, you know, designer or coacher, um, I think we do have, I don't think we, we have Parisian fashion. I don't think we have any worth or any, you know, big recognizable names. Um, so that would be neat too. Uh, I, I'm also curious, uh, do you each have a favorite piece in the collection? And I'd love to know why. Yes. Oh, that's so tough. You can only um, choose one. <laughs> I have I have probably a top three. So um, the the white 19 teens dress is, is definitely in there. Um, there's also um, a couple of kimono in the collection, including an early 20th century like Taisho era, Yuzen, Kuro Tomasode. Um, so that's that's pretty great. And mine would be, um, I'm drawn more to the, the stories behind things. And so I'll, I'll show you, it's sitting up in a box right there. <laughs> I brought it down. But that was an 1850s wedding dress. And it just has this powerful, amazing story. Um, it was worn by a woman who was married in um, upstate New York and moved to Rockford, Illinois. And she died in childbirth a year after her wedding. And her clothes were packed away in a trunk and just kind of passed down through the family and in the 20th century donated to a museum. And so to have this complete trousseau from, you know, wedding dress to maternity nightgowns to petty coats to drawers um, from this woman who died and kind of disappeared off the recorded history books, you know, so it's just this physical evidence of one of countless women who, you know, had the same fate, who died in childbirth, who didn't leave behind a historical record, but through her possessions, we were able to recreate. Oh, wait, that was the last talk I gave. You know who that is. That's we Sarah actually Wayne's have a program ones. recorded. It's a fabulous program. So two more questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, do you have any bustle cages or supports from the 19th century? We do um, not, we don't have any 1860s, which is like the Scarlet O'Hara, you know, like big, huge circumference. Um, sadly, we don't have that. We have some like bustle pads from the um, 18, probably 80s. And then we've got some wire crinolines from the 1890s. Um, and those are, I'll show you the box. <laughs> those are over there. I should have pulled that one down too. <laughs> Next time, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to do it many times. You have a lot of fantastic things to look at. Um, I guess my, my final question uh, to you is what's next? What are you, um, uh, what sort of exhibits are coming up? For the Illinois State Museum, um, what I'm currently working on is an exhibition called Growing Up X, which is finally going to shine the light and give some love to the forgotten generation, Generation X. Um, so I just actually came from researching video game arcades and had to switch gears in my brain to think about women's textiles from, you know, history. Um, and beyond that, our first costume collection or exhibit was 19th century. Um, I'd love to do a follow up that dives into the 20th century. Wonderful. Well, I want to just say this has been such a treat. We must do a part two. Um, Erica and Christine, thank you so much for taking us through uh, this amazing collection and, and sharing your thoughts about it. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us today uh, for other programs, uh, fashion as well as other subjects. Uh, presented by the National Arts Club, you can take a look at our YouTube channel. You can also visit us at nationalartsclub.org and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. I'm David Zyla.